Welcome, everybody. Um, I'm Jeff Newcorn, uh, Professor of Psychiatry and Pediatrics, Director of the Center of Excellence in ADHD and Related Disorders at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. I'm also the immediate past president of the American Professional Society of ADHD and Related Disorders. And uh, this uh, edition of the Frontiers in Psychiatric Treatment is going to uh, is going to spotlight ADHD across the lifespan. And I want to welcome you uh, and thank you for your interest in the topic. And uh, we're going to wait just a couple of minutes for um, people to convene. I understand that a lot of people have signed up for this. So very, very much looking forward to uh, speaking with you today. OK, I think I'll begin. Why are we not advancing? Okay, here are my disclosures. I do have the uh, opportunity to consult to uh, several companies that make medications for ADHD or devices for ADHD, and I also receive support for my research from NIDA and NICHD. But we're gonna begin with a section on uh, an overview of ADHD pathophysiology diagnosis and clinical presentation across the lifespan and we'll do that for about a third of the time, and then we're going to move into um, move into talking about evaluation and treatment. All right. So, what is ADHD? Uh, clearly, it's a condition for which you can get great clip art pictures. And as you can see here, the um, clip art is certainly very well developed for children who are overactive, not with the program, befuddled, uh, not organized but now also uh, moving in to focus on adults who also wonder if they have ADHD. And here on this slide, you see the, um, the DSM uh, behavioral descriptors for inattention and hyperactivity impulsivity on either side of the slide, abbreviated of course. And then uh, what we like to say in the middle of the slide is that ADHD often represents the tip of the iceberg. And here under this iceberg, we have a lot of the impairments that are associated with ADHD. And we'll mention these later, but as you can see, um, suicide, suicidal behavior, um, uh, occupational under attainment and losing jobs, substance use and abuse, school dropout, um, emotional dysregulation and uh, anger outbursts and problems with driving and um, auto automobile accidents. And, uh, criminality and and and, and even um, uh, teen pregnancy. Now, how is ADHD defined? What's well, defined in DSM is now as a neurodevelopmental disorder. Uh, it requires a threshold level of symptoms of inattention and or hyperactivity impulsivity that are present for six months or more. And it um, additionally uh, specifies that if you're 17 years and older, you only would need five to qualify for the diagnosis. And that is in recognition of the fact that older people with ADHD may have fewer actual symptoms, but, uh, but uh, with a high degree of impairment. And some people have argued that four would be the proper, uh, proper threshold rather than five. Now the symptoms, uh, at least some of the symptoms must have been present before the age of 12. That's an increase from seven uh, previously. Um, uh, and um, part of the difficulty here in establishing the age of onset is recognizing on the one hand, the early onset of ADHD, but then also the fact that more older people are being diagnosed and the idea of retrospective uh, diagnosis and recall uh, is, is more complex, uh, really isolating when uh, problems begin. And there's now been several important papers in the literature as well on whether there is or is not adult onset ADHD. And this is based on um, individuals who were included in epidemiological studies as children uh, and who did not report ADHD, who then reported having ADHD as adults. Uh, but that I would say is a complicated area. And, uh, and I think that um, uh, there's, a, there's a lot to be said about that. We, we do think that if there's adult onset ADHD, it's still very, very small. Now, impairment from symptoms must be present in two or more settings, school, work, home, or other. 
it's, um, it doesn't require two or more informants to report on those settings, although it's good to get multiple informants providing information. Uh, and it's easy to elicit symptoms across settings if you know how to talk about the way ADHD presents across settings. And I hope I'll give you some of the flavor of that in this talk. Now you have to have significant impairment um, and we say in social, academic, or occupational functioning. And symptoms should not be better accounted for by another mental or physical disorder. But um, in the past, that meant that you couldn't have autistic spectrum disorder, and, and now it's stipulated that you can. We'll talk briefly about the way ADHD symptoms present across the lifespan in the next few slides. On the left side of the slide, you'll see uh, basically the way the item is described in DSM. And you'll see these items are mainly written for childhood presentations. And then we'll think about the way it presents across a lifespan. Uh, make the point that inattention related problems and executive dysfunction represent leading reasons for seeking treatment in all age groups. And that is especially true in adolescents and adults. And you can see that uh, the problems with sustaining attention um, and, and, and focused attention, um, you know, mushroom out a bit to include problems with executive function, organization, time management, uh, independent functioning, uh, procrastination and avoiding tasks that demand sustained effort, um, and um, initi problems initiating and completing tasks and, and switching tasks. Uh, and of course, it is possible to mitigate some of this uh, by uh, some, you know, lifestyle uh, modifications or support staff who can help you organize and manage uh, your time and your activities. Now, hyperactivity, and, um, and, and here we split hyperactivity and impulsivity. Um, we like to say that aimless restlessness, like you have in childhood, often migrates to purposeful restlessness in older people. Um, hyperactivity tends to decline with age. Um, and on the other hand, it's, it's more often present than people even in clinical settings acknowledge. And I say even in clinical settings because the overwhelming um, uh, percentage of clinical referrals in older people is for inattention and executive function related impairments. But if you dig deeper, and you understand the way in which activity problems present in older people, you'll identify a fair amount of it. So um, you will see people who squirm and fidget. Uh, usually adults can stay seated. Uh, running climbs excessively. When we talk about older people, we talk about uh, just an internal sense of restlessness. Um, and so, um, you know, avoiding situations with low activity needing to be uh, active, making a lot of trips, uh, moving around a lot, being easily bored in low activity situations. Uh, again, hyperactivity is often experienced rather than manifested in older people. Now, impulsivity also decreases uh, with age, but when it's present, it often carries serious consequences. And you can see that the DSM descriptors of inattention are relatively high frequency as you would want them to be, but also relatively trivial relative to the kind of difficulty that people can get into with impulsivity. The blurting out answers, finishing other people's sentences, making random comments, having trouble waiting your turn, interrupting, intruding, intrusiveness. Uh, sure, but you know, it doesn't say running into the street without looking. Um, and uh, so even some of the lower frequency behaviors in childhood are, are not described. And then, um, and then in older people, you know, we want to think about poor frustration tolerance. Um, and um, um, hang on a second. So, and that can relate to quitting jobs, ending relationships, um, losing your temper, driving too fast, making hasty decisions. I love the term hasty. Uh, now, a hasty could be contrasted with decisive, both are fast, but one is proper and one is improper. Um, and so some of that is in the eye of the beholder. Impulsive aggression, which is typically verbal, but, but not always. 
Uh, and you can see why these can, can cause very serious problems. So why am I? Uh, I'm not advancing. There it is. All right, now ADHD is highly prevalent across the lifespan. In the US, prevalence rates range from about eight to 11%, depending on age and gender. Although I would note that the worldwide rates are typically around 5%. Uh, this varies based on the definition that's used, the cultural and national sensibility um, and, and norms about what's appropriate in terms of attentional function and uh, self-regulatory function. Uh, you know, the prevalence goes down a bit in adolescence as a hyperactive impulsive symptoms decline. Um, and further into adulthood, we now have very good prevalence figures in adulthood showing that about four and a half percent of adults in the U.S. are treated, uh, uh, have, have ADHD, and, and a vast majority of them are untreated. Now, uh, this 11 percent figure is uh, no doubt too low. Um, based on the fact that this study, uh, the National uh, Comorbidity Survey replication uh, is now uh, almost two decades old, but, uh, but I would say probably about 25% are treated. And you can see, you can back into that prevalence rate any of a number of ways. So now, how do you get ADHD? We're gonna talk a bit about neuroanatomical and neurochemical basis of ADHD. We're gonna talk a little bit about genetics too. Uh, CNS insults are here, they're important. You can seem not to have it. And then if you have a CNS insult before a certain age and it presents with ADHD symptoms, uh, you can qualify for the diagnosis. And certainly older people with CNS insults often have, uh, often have uh, uh, symptoms of ADHD, even if they don't carry the diagnosis of ADHD. The really interesting one in this slide is the environmental factors and the relationship of environmental factors to ADHD. Uh, almost all of the established environmental factors are pre and perinatal, uh, low birth weight, very low birth weight, prematurity, uh, exposure to drugs and alcohol in utero, but they're very hard to disentangle from genetic effects because uh, people who carry the ADHD genotype, of course, are more often um, likely to um, demonstrate these behaviors, have these problems. And, and, and so it's, it's been tricky. Now, there has been a lot of interest um, in uh, other uh, postnatal environmental causes, including, uh, for example, uh, screens, television watching. There have been several, there's been a bunch of papers really mainly coming from uh, pediatric literature and, and some guidelines from the Academy of Pediatrics about limiting TV viewing and screen times because of their association with ADHD. But I would note that the studies that they're based on are mainly uh, association studies. They don't prove uh, causality in the direction of the finding. Um, but uh, certainly there's a lot of, a lot of interest in that. Now, I mentioned that ADHD is highly heritable, the heritability coefficient of about 70 to 75% in twin studies uh, makes it as heritable as schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and any other psychiatric disorder except uh, autistic spectrum disorder, um, um, which has a somewhat higher um, genetic loading. Um, a lot of candidate genes have been looked at uh, mainly because of what we know about the biology of self-regulatory function and attention and uh, inhibitory control, uh, but they and you know and they have but they have very low odds ratios and they they replicate but they don't replicate in in any meaningful way and they don't appear in in the recent GWAS study that um, uh, was published and there's now another one uh, in review or in press with an even larger number, are there now over about 30,000 um, samples in that uh, GWAS, uh, multi-site GWAS um, study. And, and they identified 12 independent gene loci uh, associated with the disorder. And that number is increasing. Uh, although interestingly, the initial 12 didn't all appear in the, uh, in the replicated uh, sample. Now, persistent symptoms of ADHD are associated with potentially serious con consequences. I mentioned this early on. Um, and um, uh, poor academic outcome and academic underachievement 
uh, failing grades, um, suspension and, and being held back, um, occupational underattainment as well as educational underattainment, and lower earnings across all SES levels, including uh, white collar and professional individuals. Uh, those with ADHD compared to their non-ADHD uh, peers have lower earning potential and, and lower uh, occupational attainment. Of course, consequences of pers persistent impulsivity are very severe, and you can see them here. Um, and uh, I mentioned them, mentioned them in the earlier slide, so I won't repeat it. Now, the initial conceptualizations of ADHD were of a disorder of executive dysfunction, but that has been broadened over the last two decades to um, what was initially referred to as the dual pathway uh, model of ADHD. So the pairing really executive uh, control and the, and, 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 and the, um, um, the contribution of reward and reward circuitry. And this slide shows you both the neurobiological basis as well as the psychological processes that then key into the behavior, into the similar behavior. So under executive control, you, you, with the executive function uh, um, um, circuit, you have, you know, attentional dysfunction, inhibitory deficits, um, uh, and um, the reward mechanisms re result in problems with short and delay reward gradient, meeting, meaning problems with having to wait and needing more immediate reinforcement, uh, not being able to, to delay gratification real well. And of course, you can see that both of those, um, both of those pathways will feed into emotional dysregulation. And it's interesting because ADHD really hasn't been considered a disorder of emotional control. Uh, and really uh, cognitive control and then cognitive control and behavioral control. But uh, as you can see here, and there is uh, a significant um, feeding in of emotional discontrol and actually the rates of emotional discontrol in ADHD are quite high uh, and especially high in adult ADHD. Now, uh, further complicating the picture is that, uh, you know, uh, inattention, for example, as a cardinal symptom of ADHD doesn't occur in a vacuum. And um, uh, we like to tell people that, um, that, all, that all people with ADHD can pay attention and all people without ADHD cannot pay attention. And it's just a matter of to what and for how long. And you know, uh, this slide was taken from a spin-off study from the, that we were involved with, with Nora Volkov um, and, and uh, showing the correlation of uh, motivation, uh, poor motivation and inattention symptoms. So, and, and what do we know? We know that people with ADHD uh, typically can pay attention better to things that they're really interested in. And so much so that they'll tell you that it probably is an ADHD because they really can pay attention. But that, that's, that's misleading. Uh, it's really attention in low reward and uh, uh, situations that, that are not intrinsically interesting. So this slide uh, represents more of the contemporary view of the, of the biology of ADHD, incorporating the biological basis of this more expanded view of the disorder. And we see here the cortical and subcortical brain regions involved in ADHD, contribution to the catecholamines, dopamine, and norepinephrine. It shows you the executive control network and uh, including even the cerebellum here. Um, um, then you have uh, the reward network and, you know, limbic system. Uh, well, by the way, there are high, high concentration of dopamine transporters. Uh, at the alerting network, why? Because, um, because you pay attention to things that um, you consider important, right? Uh, and then finally, the default mode network, which you're not really going to talk much about in this talk, but it's really important and the sort of interplay between what we call the task positive regions, regions that activate when you have to pay focused attention to a task, and then uh, the other regions, which you know are more active when you're not doing task related activities or when you're doing more integrative thinking, uh, and, and, and you need to turn those down. Now, I'll just make the point briefly that um, ADHD uh, often occurs in the context of other conditions. 
uh, and it needs to be distinguished from many of those other conditions. This is uh, a Venn diagram from the MTA study, uh, multimodal treatment study of uh, children with ADHD, which was begun about 20, over 25 years ago now, um, close to 30 years ago at the outset. And these were parent structured interviews of kids who were seven to 10 years old at study entry. And you can see the large number of kids who had uh, oppositional and conduct disorders, uh, but also mood and anxiety disorders and, and tick disorders. What isn't represented on this slide, but is important is comorbidity with learning disorders. Um, uh, and, uh, and also now uh, autistic spectrum disorders. And you wouldn't see substance use disorders in this population of children, but you do see it in adults, you see it prominently. Um, and uh, the only uh, drug that is specifically uh, associated with ADHD is nicotine. Um, and, and you see very high rates of mood and bipolar disorder, anxiety disorders in adulthood and, and, and substance use disorders as well. So to summarize this section here, uh, I'll say that ADHD is highly prevalent and impairing condition, which persists across the lifespan. Uh, impairment touches many functional domains beyond school. You really shouldn't think of it as a school or an academic problem. You should think of it as a broader problem in um, self-regulation, including cognitive and behavioral and emotional regulation, uh, of course, which will often present with difficulties in an academic situation. Um, uh, it, it can be more difficult to recognize in adults, A, because uh, some of the other conditions it needs to be distinguished from or that it runs with are more prevalent in older people than younger people, and also because adults are less overtly hyperactive. Most adults are not diagnosed or treated. Uh, recent models of ADHD highlight the importance of symptomatic and functional domains not described in the DSM, as I uh, recently uh, spoke about, and studies of ADHD pathophysiology consistent with this expanded conceptualization of the disorder. All right, now we're gonna talk about evaluation and treatment across the lifespan. So why is evaluation of ADHD complex? Well, as we mentioned, the core symptoms of ADHD are present in all individuals to some extent. And so you wanna think about how much and how impairing. You wanna have a sense of what's normal. Comorbidity is common. So, you know, are the symptoms related to ADHD or comorbid disorder? And here, longitudinal history is critical. Uh, impairment in two realms of life can be relative and difficult to determine. This is especially true for the high functioning patient. Um, and uh, um, you need, again, to learn how to look for, for these problems. As I mentioned, retrospective recall of symptoms is problematic, and there's no single litmus test to verify the diagnosis. So although there are now some test aids that are being developed and uh, that um, can be used together with clinical assessment. Now we have a lot of rating scales. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about them, but just to highlight the importance of using symptom-based rating scales. Obviously the Connor scales um, were, were the forerunners of this over 50 years ago, uh, but we have several broadband scales, the Achenbach also uh, and the BASC. And then we have more narrow band scales like the ADHD rating scale. These are these are well-normed and uh, scales um, and uh, uh, frequently used uh, in clinical assessment and also in clinical trials. Um, uh, uh, SNAP4 is another uh, symptom-based uh, scale. The Vanderbilt is another one. Uh, Mark Wolreich uh, with the American Academy of Pediatrics. The SCAMP is an observational scale. It's important in adolescents to include their perceptions. And so there are a couple of self-report scales, the Connors and the Achenbach uh, are available. Uh, there are a number of scales to be used in evaluating adult ADHD. Here I would uh, mention in particular the ASRS, that's the second to the last from the bottom, which was developed uh, in association with the World Health Organization. Uh, the AISRS, which is an investigator rated symptom scale. Um, and, and, um, what, uh, and you have the CARS as well. And what differs about these scales, even though they're also 
symptom-based scales is that they really, they, they dial in on developmentally rele relevant impairments. And why do we treat ADHD? It may seem like a silly question to ask. Um, well, you know, it's interesting. If you're, if you're a pharmaceutical company, your job is to decrease the level of core symptoms. And if you want to get your drug for ADHD approved, the way you do it is show that you reduce core symptoms. And that's the only thing you have to show to get approved. And you have to be better than placebo in the United States. And in Europe, you have to also uh, show that you have value compared to comparators. Uh, but, um, but in clinical practice, what's most important is to minimize impairment from core symptoms. It doesn't really matter if you um, reduce symptoms and you don't really improve the ways that they manifest in people's lives and the ways that they hold them back. And uh, it's really important to identify certain target symptoms, which really reflect the ways in which symptoms affect people, things that you really need to make better and to follow those over the course of treatment. So this could be academic or occupational problems related to attention or task completion of time management or relationship problems or self-esteem. Uh, it's very intriguing to think about altering the course of other disorders as a consequence of ADHD treatment. Uh, some of the ones I mentioned earlier, and then a group that I didn't mention, uh, some of the personality disorders, which also um, are elevated in association with ADHD. Um, now, there are a variety of guidelines available for ADHD. Uh, I highlight here the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. And I mentioned the American Academy of Family Physicians because they're the only group that has put uh, in the United States, has put out a guideline for adult ADHD, although it's, it's not that well publicized or that well known. Um, um, all of the guidelines uh, stress the importance of using established rating scales uh, for diagnosis and monitoring treatment and the importance of assessing for comorbidity. Uh, the guidelines suggest use of um, evidence-based behavioral treatment as a first step in young children uh, uh, in the preschool or kindergarten uh, years, uh, and then recommend the use of methylphenidate if the symptoms are still moderate to severe uh, following evidence-based treatment. Um, and uh, in older, in older kids and adolescents, uh, medication is considered first line, but together with evidence-based treatment, that's the preferred approach, highlighting, of course, the fact that stimulants have the best effect size and then, you know, then, and then down, on, uh, down, down the line. Uh, the importance of targeting problems in multiple settings and, and the problems addressing adherence to treatment. And then in adulthood, beginning with pharmacotherapy, but also thinking about uh, non-pharmacotherapy as well. And I'll talk to you about that in just a moment. Now, it's important to consider environmental modifications for individuals with ADHD. Think about structuring the environment. Uh, identify and avoid distracting environments. This could be where you shop, how you work, uh, how you manage your physical space, and how you manage tasks you have to do. Uh, so that they're organized, uh, perhaps uh, um, this could be bills and messages and uh, altering communication. Uh, you you want to have time structured. You want to have brief instructions. You want to create automatic, automated pathways when you can for getting things done. We have a lot of external aids available now, and some of them are used in um, organizational skills training for uh, older people with ADHD, electronic calendars with day planners, tape recorders, notepads, checklists, reminder, alarms, and various task-specific devices, pill boxes, key finders, et cetera. And helping people understand how to use them can be a very important aspect of treatment uh, with uh, people who are old enough to use that treatment. Now, in younger children, behavioral parent training and teacher behavioral classroom management are the best uh, evidence-based treatments. Um, and there are a variety of types of behavioral parent training, uh, and they're very good for the behavioral manifestations of, it, of ADHD more than the attentional problems. You can help attentional function some. All of it is um, the, the, the classroom management, uh, 
often uses um, a home-based reinforcement of school reported problems requires uh, uh, very good collaboration and communication between home and school. Uh, metacognitive therapy in adults was developed, organizational skills training is a component of that, and then subsequently um, um, developed for um, adolescents and, and, and even school-age children as well. There are a variety of computer-mediated cognitive training tools that are being uh, studied. CogMed was well-developed, probably not so good for ADHD. Um, there's neurofeedback, there are video game technologies, the Achilles system, uh, which is called Endeavor, uh, was recently cleared by the FDA, and several others are being studied right now. I will make the point that all of the therapies that are evidence-based for ADHD are behavioral, uh, that, play, that un, unstructured play therapy and social skills training uh, have not proven to help with ADHD symptoms, but they can be useful for comorbid disorders. All right, now we're going to talk about medication. Um, so uh, I think I've got all of them on this slide. And what I like to say here is that um, we either have a lot of medicines for ADHD or not that many at all. Uh, why? Because as you see, the top, top part of the slide is dominated by different formulations of two classes of stimulants, the methylphenidate class and the amphetamine class. Uh, we do have two classes of approved non-stimulants, the uh, noradrenergic reuptake inhibitors, that's Dritera and Kelbury. By the way, the slide uses brand names with a key to uh, generic names because it's impossible to figure out what we're talking about if we try to write up for all of these uh, different formulations of stimulants with generic names. And then the other class of approved non-stimulants are the alpha-2 agonists, Intunif or guanfacine and cafe or clonidine. There are a variety of off-label medications, mainly that uh, impact noradrenergic function, a uh, variety of investigational drugs, still some novel stimulant formulations being developed, uh, sentinaphidine, a triple reuptake inhibitor, uh, being developed may or may not be scheduled. Uh, that's too early to say. The ones in parentheses are, are basically not being studied at the moment. How do these drugs work? Stimulants and atomoxetine work by blocking uh, presynaptic uh, reuptake. So, um, and so amphetamine and methylphenidate block reuptake of dopamine and norepinephrine. Uh, this is on the um, the outside surface of the presynaptic neuron. But amphetamine additionally blocks reuptake into these intracellular uh, uh, synaptic vessels. And so in the presence of amphetamine, you have much more freely diffusing neurotransmitter that diffuses out. And so amphetamine produces release of, uh, of neurotransmitter, not just reuptake. Both produce increased synaptic neurotransmitter. Uh, and then for atomoxidine and veloxidine, veloxazine, norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, you have just a selective reuptake of the norepinephrine uh, transported here on the presynaptic neuron. Um, we'll talk about the alpha-2 agonists a, a bit later. Stimulants are great for core symptoms of ADHD, but they're also good for a variety of associated features, behavioral noncompliance, impulsive aggression, social interactions, academic efficiency, academic accuracy, family dynamics, self-esteem. Uh, by efficiency, we mean getting more stuff done by per unit time. Accuracy means not making careless mistakes. Um, the effect sizes are really large. They're, they're certainly among the highest in psychiatry and even medicine. And, uh, but they're only good when the drugs are active and, um, and you know, even long acting stimulants typically don't last all day. And so understanding time action effects of stimulants and managing time action effects of stimulant is extremely important. Now the current um, thrust of treatment focuses on extended duration of action, not on the use of immediate release stimulants. And we have extended release formulations of methylphenidate and amphetamine. And we have formulations that go six to eight hours, 10 to 12 hours, uh, and, uh, and, and even longer. Um, but um, but um, um, 
again, you typically don't get as long a duration as the drugs are labeled for. Um, and I can explain why, but it takes too long and it's complicated. Um, so there, often people are using combinations of extended release and immediate release formulations to cover the full day, or even uh, using extended release formulations multiple times in a day, you'd say multiple meaning twice. I, I would like to make the point that um, although people typically respond to either methylphenidate or amphetamine, if you give it to them, um, there is relative preferential response. Uh, I wouldn't pay too much attention to the greater response for amphetamine here, although there's some suggestion that amphetamine is a bit more effective, whether that's because it's, it's more potent in the label dose range or really is a bit more potent. Uh, that, that isn't exactly known, but there are people that do relatively better in response and do relatively better in terms of tolerability. And it's really important to try both stimulants uh, to optimize and maximize response. Now, when you treat older people, it's important to remember that the treatment targets are gonna um, shift towards more inattention related impairments with a, also a, often a primary focus on mood dysregulation as an, as an associated feature. You need to cover longer periods of the day. So you need to dose adequately and you have to make sure that drug is active over the course of the whole day. And you have to monitor particular for cardiovascular uh, effects of these drugs. Um, because that, that becomes a bigger problem in older people. Uh, I, I do wanna mention that there have been some uh, large um, scale studies, over 100,000 uh, patients from uh, both in, in, in children and adults looking at risk for severe cardiovascular outcomes, uh, finding no greater risk over uh, non-treatment. And that is reassuring. I also wanna um, highlight uh, the difficulty we have with stimulant misuse, abuse, and diversion, and the large number of young adults, and particularly college students, who misuse, abuse, or divert these drugs. All right, in the time remaining, I'm going to talk about non-stimulants and give you sort of a sort of a primer on how to start using these drugs. Stimulants are extremely effective, but you see poor response or tolerability in some patients. And often these are related because if you don't, if you don't tolerate the drug so well, you probably can't dose it optimally. Uh, so suboptimal response then becomes not uncommon, even in people who are responders. Uh, you have relative or labeled contraindications for some comorbid conditions. Think here about tics, anxiety, and substance abuse, although you can use stimulants in all of those populations. Some patients won't take stimulants, some patients, some doctors won't prescribe them. Um, and you have, as I mentioned, risk for diversion abuse. And, and so, and you have time action property uh, complications. So, you know, if you could get drugs that work, you know, close to as well as stimulants, have them work in the background all day long, not be abusable, that would really be fantastic. And that remains, a, you know, uh, one aspect of the holy grail in drug development for ADHD. Now, this is a comparator study of oros methylphenidate or Concerta and atomoxetine, uh, which was the first uh, non-stimulant that was approved by the FDA. And you see that uh, methylphenidate, and this is in kids you'll see, uh, and, and adolescents, you see that, um, that uh, methylphenidate is more effective, although uh, as you can see here in people who are stimulant naive, the difference between uh, stimulant and non-stimulant was much smaller. Both were, you know, uh, considerably better than placebo. Drugs are effective. I like to say that atomoxetine is really great for the people that respond to it. And I know that always drives people crazy. But the reason I say that is that these effect sizes uh, include the fact that a lot of people are non-responders to atomoxetine. So the response, that, that effect size that, I, that you saw just before, which is about an effect size of 0.7, nothing to sneeze at, uh, is mainly carried by the excellent responders. And I didn't say this when I spoke about impairment earlier. You really got to get over about 40 to 50% symptom improvement to, um, to get 
much of an impact on functional status. And, and that's why you wanna um, try to optimize treatment. I'll make the point that atomoxetine was the first drug for ADHD that actually uh, had a label and was approved in adults. Now there, now there are others, veloxagene, which just came to market, recently got, uh, got a label as well. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, I'm just looking at the chat here. Um, and, and of course, uh, uh, several long acting stimulants, including formulations of methylphenidate and amphetamine are now labeled for use in adults as well. Um, make the point that atomoxetine uh, is uh, uh, probably pretty good for individuals with ADHD and anxiety disorders. This was a study done in children and adolescents with overanxious disorder, separation anxiety disorder, and uh, social anxiety disorder. And this is the um, this is the um, um, the effect on anxiety um, with an effect size about a half, and um, uh, measured by the pediatric anxiety rating scale. And the effect size for ADHD in this study was about one, so really, really robust response in this group. Veloxazine, also a norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor, hasn't been studied in the same way, but veloxazine was um, was uh, an approved uh, antidepressant with known anti-anxiety effects uh, in, uh, in the UK and a couple of other European countries. So it would probably be uh, good with this population, but that will require further study. I just want to, I can't go through all the dosing. I just wanted to make the point that atomoxetine is metabolized by CYP2D6 and about 7% of the population are poor metabolizers. And the, the difference between a drug uh, concentration and half-life in poor metabolizers and extensive metabolizers is dramatic. Uh, so your half-life in extensive metabolizers is about four and a half hours. And your half-life in poor metabolizers is 19 to 21 hours. And um, so you may be able to use a lower dose in poor metabolizers and uh, you also may be able to cover the whole day better in poor metabolizers. And so that would really be a relative advantage if you have a poor metabolizer, or you could pharmacologically manufacture uh, poor CYP2D6 metabolism by co-administration with fluoxetine or paroxetine. Uh, and that uh, is a paper that uh, describes that. I did wanna just make the point that um, that the, the main issues with using norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors are somnolence and fatigue. Also, you can get pretty nasty uh, nausea or GI uh, discomfort. You do have to take the drugs with food. Uh, you have increased heart rate and blood pressure comparable to stimulants. You don't have as much of slowing of growth of velocity as you do with stimulants, about half. And in Although the drug is labeled for adults, it can be hard to use, particularly in males, because of problems with urinary retention and sexual dysfunction that you would expect from a norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. All right, briefly about the alpha-2 agonists. Uh, this very lovely cartoon was done uh, through the lab of, of, of Amy Arnston, and you can see published here. Um, and uh, it shows how these drugs work. They, their principal action is postsynaptic. It was thought that they were presynaptic. They have some presynaptic effects, but as you can see here, they, uh, they block off this postsynaptic ion channel and they allow an impulse to be carried forward. They often modify neurotransmission of, of, of other um, at neurotransmitters, including glutamate as illustrated here. Uh, showing the interactive effect of neurotransmitters across the, um, you know, in relation to, um, um, in, um, you know, the brain mechanisms that observe uh, ADHD-related uh, symptoms and problems. Now, the long-acting alpha-2 agonists are approved for use uh, in the United States by the FDA. The way those drugs are made is by increasing the, the Tmax, the time to maximum concentration. You can see it here on this slide. So uh, you probably can see my pointer. So this is guanfacine immediate release. This is clonidine immediate release. This is extended release, extended release. And you can see that how different the Tmax is. 
Uh, the half-life isn't that different, right? It's really the Tmax that carries the long-acting effect. It does mean that if you want to use the drugs for sedation, um, you, you and you want the you you want your maximum blood level at the time of bedtime, you have to think about when you're administering the drug. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, the initial conceptualization of the alpha two agonists is that they were going to be really good for executive function. They had really good activity in the dorsolateral uh, prefrontal cortex and uh, various animal studies have shown that we did in some of our imaging studies as well. And yet in clinical practice, the drugs are mainly used for their behavioral effects. Uh, and they're better for um, behavior than attention. They're, of course, uh, attention and behavior are intercorrelated. Uh, but uh, you can see that the uh, use for oppositional symptoms and also for behavioral symptoms that last over the course of the whole day, these drugs can be very useful. Uh, and so that's an important thing to think about. They're also very useful for treatment of tick disorders as from a uh, meta-analysis done by Michael Block now over 10 years ago, uh, showing the utility of, of these drugs as well. Uh, particularly out here, as you see it. This is the effect size for ticks on the x-axis. Just mentioned that these drugs also are highly sedating. There's some question about rebound hypertension on discontinuation, so you have to taper them when you stop them. Um, there was some concern about cardiovascular effects of the drugs, but that's been mainly debunked. Um, interesting, the alpha-2 agonists are approved for combined treatment with stimulants. Both clonidine and guanfacine extended release are approved for combined treatment. It's one of the, one of the only examples that we have. And, and they're often used that way as well. Uh, I'm just going to talk very briefly over the last couple of minutes uh, about um, uh, how to choose medications and how to use them. Uh, you want to think about the results of clinical trials. Uh, you want to think about mechanism of action. You want to think about head, head efficacy, but this tells you about groups. You want to think about special populations with comorbidity that will hone down on a subgroup. But there are a lot of other factors, individualized factors that will relate to um, uh, the medication that you or the patient might want to choose to use. Uh, nature and characteristics of the response, duration of effects, tolerability and safety, preference. Uh, and previous treatment experience, of course, the corollary of which is the treatment selected at a particular moment in time may not be the one with the largest effect size in clinical trials, but may be a very good choice for a selected individual. And this is some of the art of what we have to learn to do well. Uh, it's very important to titrate to optimal response, uh, particularly if you want to minimize impairment. As I say, you've got to get to about 40 to 50 percent improvement in symptom scores, see, uh, you see a substantial uh, drop in impairment. So uh, you've, you've got to try to optimize treatment and uh, indicate here various ways of doing it, using symptom-based scales and, and identifying treatment targets and following them. Systematic testing of higher doses, therefore, becomes really important. Think about getting fitted for a pair of glasses. And you go in, and this one looks like it's pretty good, but they always test the next higher refraction, right? Why? Because it looks like it's good, but you don't know what's really good until you see better. And so uh, you can always back off, okay? Lack of efficacy is often related to inadequate dosing. And that may be because we don't dose properly, as well as the fact that patients may not tolerate the dose that they would need to do optimally. Um, up, uh, upward dose titration is often required with increasing age and size, but not, not in a linear relationship to size. Um, how and when to combine medication treatments, short and long acting stimulants to cover longer periods of the day and critical periods of functioning, stimulants and non-stimulants to augment therapeutic effects, to minimize adverse effects, to also cover longer periods of time, to enable you to use lower stimulant dose and to treat comorbidity. And of course, thinking about the importance of treating other disorders uh, as well. Situation which non-stimulants could be used preferentially, poor response or tolerability with stimulants, generally poor response is secondary to poor tolerability. Presence of a co-occurring condition which can be 
adversely affected by stimulants and or better treated with non-stimulants or treatment of ADHD symptoms in certain conditions other than ADHD. Autism is a really good example of one where the non-stimulants uh, may have really preferential use. And finally, about improving adherence to treatment, it's one of our biggest problems. Uh, you can see here uh, studies that show the fall off in adherence over time, both acutely and over time. So possible solutions to educate patients and parents regarding anticipated results, benefits, and possible adverse events, creating the right expectation for treatment, providing frequent follow-up early in treatment, striving for dose optimization, and identifying and treating comorbidity. So to summarize, ADHD is a complex and multifaceted neurodevelopmental disorder that has a strong biological basis. It begins in childhood and often persists over the lifespan. There's a high degree of impairment and societal cost. Effective treatments impact multiple brain regions, attention inhibitory control, default mode processing, reward motivation, and emotion regulation. Numerous medication options show very good response. Stimulants are generally more effective than non-stimulants, but non-stimulants have a major role in treatment of ADHD and comorbidity and can be really important in managing risk for substance abuse. Treatment does not normalize ADHD and symptoms often persist over time despite treatment. There have been some really good papers about that, particularly one uh, by Maggie Sibley um, that came out recently. And combined treatment can offer benefits in selected cases, and that can be stimulant and non-stimulant combinations and combined medication and psychosocial treatment. So I've gone over by a few minutes, but I hope uh, it was worth it in terms of the material presented. I'm gonna stop sharing slides and go to the questions, which I will not be able to cover the large number, but I'll try to do the best I can. Uh, here's, here's an interesting question. Do you think that the majority of people with adult onset ADHD have simply outgrown their coping mechanism, methods? Um, and uh, I think it's possible. Uh, and uh, um, what is implicit in this question is that they had problems that they had to cope with. Um, and, 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 and that I think gets to the really important point that um, we think that the people that uh, may identify in adulthood have, have, have not been well enough um, uh, identified in, in childhood and uh, or, or, or was subthreshold, or maybe were really smart and didn't have to function uh, you know, with all cylinders firing. Uh, here's a question about whether ADHD can be caused by trauma. ADHD and PTSD are both related. Uh, ADHD increases risk for PTSD, and PTSD can increase risk for ADHD. Now, not all trauma is ADHD, and of course, in a lot of um, the populations you see high, high rates of trauma. Uh, I could really talk about this at some length, but focusing on the way in which the brain operates when it's traumatized and how it searches out threat stimuli in the environment and showing you which parts of the brain and how that, how that interacts with uh, focused attention. Uh, but it will divert your attention. So the simple answer to your question is yes, it can, and you wanna be aware of it. But at the same time, you don't simply wanna say, oh, I see trauma here, so I know it's not ADHD, it's trauma. That would, that would not be correct. All right. Uh, their adult lives have too many demands and too many environments. Okay. So yes, uh, the, the symptomatic presentation of ADHD is very much interactive with, um, with um, uh, demands uh, and the tasks that one has to achieve. And uh, there's a saying that I like to use uh, with my trainees and with my patients which is that impairment represents the, inter, the intersection of capacity and, and uh, context. Inter, impairment represents the intersection of capacity and context. So it's what you bring to the situation, but it's what the situation also uh, requires of you. Uh, would love to, and, and, and how you use medicines will, will often have to change um, based, on, based on the context. Um, I'm going to skip that one because it takes, uh, it's a long answer. There are so many different types of medicine for ADHD, many dosage form. 
what are the top five appear to be best choices for patients? Well, they're all good. Uh, but, you know, usually we use generic drugs before brand name drugs, but there are reasons to use some of the brand names too. And particularly, you really should inquire as to whether some, some of the brand name drugs um, are, are covered on formulary, because they are, and you may be able to give them. Uh, Listex amphetamine or Vyvanse is really a good long-acting amphetamine that is branded. Adderall XR is uh, probably the... Um, the most widely used uh, of the long-acting stimulants, Concerta or Oros methylphenidate was the first used um, focal in XR or uh, dexmethylphenidate XR because all methylphenidate is DL methylphenidate except for focal in, which is D-methylphenidate. Uh, functionally, it's the same because L-methylphenidate isn't so active. It doesn't get into the brain. It gets eliminated in the first pass. Uh, how are we doing here on questions? Not well, right? Uh, I've got four or five minutes. Uh, why do you recommend with adult ADHD, adults with ADHD avoid working in cubicles? Well, uh, I wouldn't necessarily recommend where someone work. Uh, I just, um, I mean, um, Adults with ADHD often need to be able to get up and walk around uh, and move around. Uh, being on a line of cubicles with other people working that way will identify someone who has to get up and walk around. So, you know, could could um, could make it hard for somebody. Uh, also, cubicles are not rooms, and so the potential for distraction is going to be higher. Uh, so. Those are reasons to think, but it, it's not one recommendation. It's really an individualized recommendation uh, based on uh, the problems that the individual is having, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, let's see. Now I comment on treating diverse patients, indigenous peoples, um, and how do you change your approach when they're not comfortable? I can't really comment on it. I don't have a lot of experience doing it, but I will say that um, there is a certain sensibility uh, um, um, and cultural context that you have to bring to your work in whatever uh, aspect of work in psychiatry or medicine that you do. And definitely finding medications or treatments that people are comfortable with is. Um, is an important piece of what we do and, and building expectations around that. Um, I've had a few patients tell me that they've heard that either methylphenidate or amphetamine, or the short acting ones work as long acting medications for them. If one works, the other won't and may have a paradoxical impact on the patient. Well, I mentioned that, um, that there is differential response and tolerability to methylphenidate and amphetamine. So I'd say that's true. There also is a fair degree of variability in, um, in, um, um, in half-life and duration. But remember that for, um, for amphetamine in particular, um, the behavioral half-life and the pharmacokinetic half-life are pretty different, PKPD dissociation. I mean, the half-life of amphetamine is about nine hours. Half-life of methylphenidate is two and a half hours, three hours. And yet they're both given on typically in every four or five, four hour schedule. Um, and the fact that, uh, but that, you know, that, that the behavioral effects seem to be waning doesn't mean the blood levels are, are out at all. You, you know, can figure out from what the half-life is, what the blood levels look like. So, so yeah, that, that's important to understand. Um, do I recommend any difference in ADHD medication as a function of their type, impulsive hyperactive versus inattentive? Yes, no. Do a little better with uh, impulsive hyperactive with the alpha-2 agonist. Stimulants work in both. Uh, alpha, um, uh, noradrenergic reuptake inhibitors work in both. Um, Yeah, there's a long thing about PTSD and MDD, general anxiety. Uh, I didn't actually mention substance use disorder as a frequently occurring comorbid condition, which is associated with problems in reward circuitry, executive dysfunction, et cetera, and share similar core ADHD symptoms. It looks like the neurobiological mechanisms 
involved in ADHD are similar to some of many other conditions. Does the field evolve towards the development of new treatments considering the RDOC approach? And what does the future look like uh, regarding emerging novel treatments? Fantastic points, fantastic question. Um, so far, we haven't been able to build on that important recognition, but uh, it does help us understand a bit about comorbidity and the relationship across disorders and the fact that ADHD is a risk factor for several of these other disorders. And if you think about the sort of low motivational state and the lack of interest in things in ADHD, and you think about anhedonia and depression, and you think about, um, you know, um, the need for novelty and reward in ADHD, and then you think about, you know, the low motivational state and the, the need for novelty and reward in substance use disorders, you can see why these conditions uh, frequently co-occur. Um, but do we have an answer yet about that? Not yet. What are the key updates on research studying sluggish cognitive tempo as a potential separate form of inattention? Oh, there's a lot of stuff going on that's really interesting about that. And uh, we've been studying it some in our group as well, and also together with my colleague at NYU, Len Adler. Um, so, uh, and, and one of my uh, close associates, Beth Crone, is working uh, a lot in this area as well. Uh, we're looking at some of the, um, you know, distinguishing features of sluggish cognitive tempo, also looking at aspects of drug response. Um, uh, there are some interesting papers coming out about it. And uh, there's also some of this is covered in a paper that uh, I've contributed to and that'll be in the annual research review of JCPP next year. You might want to look for that. And it was really about the, um, the, the very, the very much uh, the, on the, um, sort of expanded conceptualization of ADHD and the, 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 the different ways it presents and uh, thinking about that both from a, uh, uh, a clinical diagnostic and treatment perspective and also in terms of what ADHD is and the boundaries of ADHD. So we really recommend that. Um, how are we doing? Uh, I think I'm at time. Uh, you guys want me to stop or uh, catch? Should I keep going here or what? I think you could take one more. One more. Uh, okay. Uh, do you have a strategy for getting approval of stimulant doses over 60 milligrams a day? So stimulant would be methylphenidate is uh, typically has a top dose of 60. You can typically get amphetamine approved at 60, which is, is actually unfair because uh, amphetamine at 60 milligrams is a lot more drug than methylphenidate at 60 milligrams. Amphetamine is about twice as potent as methylphenidate. Um, and, uh, oh yeah, that's good, Kat. Um, 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 well, the first thing I do is I understand about differential response to the different classes. And so I don't drive hard above the FDA approval cap before trying the other, the other stimulant class. Understanding that you can have differential response, you're probably going to get response at a lower dose. So before I start giving more and more and more methylphenidate and getting a lot of pushback from insurance companies, I'm going to try amphetamine first or vice versa. And um, then you just have to show you failed the drugs and you've tried and you've tested systematically. Uh, and, uh, and, and of course you have to beat your head against the wall a lot because getting drugs approved uh, is not easy. Uh, I'll answer this one too. Is there genetic testing that can help with determining which medication would work for which patient with ADHD? And the answer is contrary to popular Belief, not really, uh, not in ADHD. Now, where it is helpful, and there's no predictors for amphetamine at all. They still have some predictors on the profile for methylphenidate, but these are these are uh, these are small predictors. And uh, I think the the most important thing is um, is the metabolic profile. So the uh, the impact of two D six uh, on uh, atomoxetine, for example. Uh, is really potentially important and worth knowing about. These are all great questions, and uh, but I, I'm, I'm supposed to stop, so I think I better do that. Um, but you're going to send the questions to Kat Morris, and uh, I'll try to answer them. How's that? 
All right, any, uh, any additional comments or from the people who've hosted this or from the audience that I should entertain? Um, if not, I'll say we'll, we'll conclude this session. I wanna thank you a lot for your attention and uh, I hope you found this interesting and rewarding and valuable. And, uh, and uh, uh, you know, if you want us to put on other programs, uh, you know, about ADHD, uh, let us know and we'll think about doing that, okay? Bye.